which was warned against by Professor Patricia Casey yesterday. It deals with the question of abortion on demand by precluding it insofar as that appears to me to be possible in the drafting of the bill. It deals with late-term pregnancies, which were raised by Deputy Flanagan yesterday in his questioning. It deals with ensuring by protecting doctors acting in good faith that doctors will not go to jail. The bill does not quantify risk in accordance with the X case and in accordance with the call for clinical judgment to be allowed. And in all of those circumstances, without knowing what the doctors yesterday were going to say, uh, I believe we have a starting point. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I, at the, at the end of our hearing, uh, thank Ms. Schwepp from University of Limerick, Ms. Kira Stanton from Nanyway Galway, and Oxana Mills from the Law Library. And indeed, if I may just to wish Ms. Schwepp every success with her pregnancy and wish you well. We now stand adjourned. Uh, we now stand. Brief, can I request a brief private session of the committee? No. Not, not, no, not, no, not I'm requesting house. it. No. It's in your gift to you. I'll, I'll talk to you after I suspend the meeting at quarter to twelve. We'll suspend it at quarter to twelve.
question. It's now 11.47, um, and I want to, um, again, welcome people to our public session. Can I remind members, witnesses, and those in the public gallery to please ensure that their mobile phones are switched off for the duration of the meeting, as they do interfere with the broadcasting of proceedings. Um, and I want to uh, acknowledge in the public gallery a former member of the Houses, uh, Geraldine Kennedy, you're very welcome to our proceedings today. And I, I admitted to welcoming you yesterday, but I'm glad to see you here this morning. You're very welcome. Um, just, this is our sixth session of hearings this morning uh, on the Joint Committee. Um, and just before clarification, as you know, the Bar uh, Council uh, declined an invitation to take part this morning. Just, can I just put in the record of the House that an invitation was issued to the Bar Council before Christmas, uh, and late last week the clerk of our committee spoke to people in the Bar Council by phone, and when it was confirmed that they would be in attendance with us and that they would confirm who would be attending uh, on Monday, the clerk made contact with the Bar Council again uh, early yesterday morning, uh, requesting details of who would be attending, following which we received a phone call, and then very quickly afterwards a letter that they would be declined to attend. And I want to just put on record uh, that and not to engage any war of words or any clash with the Bar Council, uh, that just to put on record that from our perspective here. Um, our session, as you know, has been condensed into one hour this morning uh, for, for this, our sixth session, which is a series of hearings uh, that the Joint Committee will be conducting over the next uh, two days to discuss the implementation of the Government decision following the recent publication of the Expert Group report on the matters relating to cases A, B, C versus Ireland. Um, and in this regard, I would like to very much welcome uh, to this session uh, from the Irish Council of Civil Liberties, Dr. Alan D.P. Brady D., and Mr. Stephen O'Hare, both from the Irish Council of Civil Liberties, who will be with us this morning. Um, so, before we commence, just to remind the witnesses regarding privilege. Witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence you have to give to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you can to do so, you are entitled thereafter into a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed only evidence you have to give is that when study matters of these proceedings is to be given, and you ask to respect the parliamentary practice effective where possible, you should not criticise and make charges against the person or persons or entity by name in such ways to make or him or her identifiable. And members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice or ruling of the chair to the effect that members should not criticise and or make charges against any person or persons outside the House or an official by name in such ways to make or him or her identifiable. And you have 10 minutes to make your opening statement, and then it will be followed by questions and answers with members for 35 minutes and now members after that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. And on behalf of the Irish Council of Liberties, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to address you here today. Um, the Irish Council of Civil Liberties is Ireland's independent human rights watchdog. We have been monitoring, educating, and campaigning for the protection of human rights in Ireland for 35 years. Uh, I myself am a member of the executive of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties Association. I hold that role in a voluntary capacity in my professional life. I'm both a practicing barrister and an adjunct lecturer in law at Trinity College Dublin, where my research focus is on constitutional rights and on human rights. I'm accompanied today by my colleague from the ICCL, uh, Stephen O'Hare. There, there are two core points that I want to address that are outlined in the submission from the ICCL uh, before the committee today. The first is in relation to matters that are settled law, matters that are really beyond dispute with regard to constitutional rights and rights under the European Convention on Human Rights. The second matter I'd like to address before the committee today is the opportunity that this uh, session presents, this legislative process presents, for this committee and for the Oireachtas to improve Ireland's human rights position actively, particularly with regard to lethal fetal abnormality. So to come to the first point in relation to matters that are settled law uh, under the Constitution, it is important to state that abortion is legal in Ireland. It is legal under the limited test within the X case, but it is legal. This committee and the Oireachtas are not engaged in analysis of whether or not abortion should be legalized. That has already happened. It happened in the X case, and arguably, it happened at the point at which the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution was introduced, and certainly very well publicized uh, advice from the Attorney General at the time made it clear that the constitutional settlement countenanced the possibility of abortion in circumstances where there was a threat to life of the mother. That legalization of abortion is limited. It is limited to the test set out by the Supreme Court in the X case. It is where there is a real and substantial risk to life of the mother and where that risk can only be avoided by termination of pregnancy. But within that test, a woman whose life is at risk, a woman who meets that test, has a constitutional right to have an abortion in this jurisdiction. That is settled law. It is not a matter that is up for discussion. In relation to that test, and something that has been controversial in relation to that test, the Supreme Court was also extremely clear that that threat to life included a risk of suicide. 
The Irish people have had two opportunities to remove that. They have chosen not to do so on both occasions. Again, that is settled law. The constitutional position here is very clear. With regard to the European Convention on Human Rights, the upshot of the ABC decision is that Ireland has been found to be in violation of Article 8 of the European Convention by the European Court of Human Rights because there is a gulf between that theoretical constitutional right and its practical implementation. And the fact that there is no effective accessible procedure in Ireland has been found to be a violation of Article 8. And so that is the clear position in relation to the European Convention on Human Rights. We have had sight of the expert group report which has been circulated widely and the ICCL would strongly endorse the analysis in that and certainly welcomes it. There are aspects of it that are of particular note. One is that the analysis makes it clear the only way for Ireland to comply with its European Convention on Human Rights obligations is to legislate for X and to do so with all due haste. In relation to certain aspects within that report, we would particularly endorse uh, Chapter 5, which sets out four principles that should guide the legislative process, and we would strongly endorse those. There are also an analysis in relation to uh, the decision-making process itself, how it should be structured, and in relation to a review process. And again, we would endorse the analysis of the expert group in relation to that. There are some aspects within that that involve a, an either-or choice. Rather than going through them one by one now and taking up my time for submission, I'd certainly be happy to deal with those in questions subsequently. So as regards the constitutional right of pregnant women whose eyes are at risk, the constitutional right to have a termination in this jurisdiction is clear. It is settled law. As regards the European Convention on Human Rights, the obligation to provide an effective and accessible procedure for finding out whether or not you meet that test is a requirement under Article 8. That is also settled law. So it is clear that legislation must be forthcoming and it must meet both of those standards, and the ICCL wants to be extremely clear about that. The second point I want to address is the opportunity that this presents for improving Ireland's human rights position, particularly with regard to the European Convention. Uh, it has been the case in the past that Ireland has been found to be in violation of the European Convention and has had to respond to that. Certainly we wouldn't be here today if there hadn't been a finding of a breach of Article 8 in the ABC decision itself. And so rather than Ireland waiting to be brought to the European Court of Human Rights and told it is in violation, this legislative process presents an opportunity for Ireland to get out in front of our human rights commitments, to seek to ensure better protection under the European Convention in Ireland than is currently provided. And it can be done during this legislative process. And I mention that specifically in relation to, to fatal or lethal fetal abnormality. Um, unfortunately, in a rare number of cases, women are faced with the very difficult and troubling news that the fetus they are carrying is not going to survive. It is not going to be born. And so in those circumstances, they face a choice. Do they continue with the pregnancy or do they not? Some women, no doubt, continue with the pregnancy and find it very fulfilling. Some women can't face it. At the moment, the decision on whether or not to do that in Ireland is made for them. They do not make that decision themselves. And not only is it made for them, it is made for them by a 19th century criminal law. That is the position in Ireland in relation to fatal or lethal fetal abnormality. And so there is a concern that this may give rise to a violation under Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which protects against inhuman or degrading treatment. There are recent decisions coming from the ECHR in relation to Article 3 in abortion which indicate that where a vulnerable woman is seeking access to abortion and is, is suffering pain and anguish as a result of uh, delays and so on in relation to that, that there has been found to be a violation of Article 3. Um, and I can make reference specifically to those, questions, those, those cases and questions and answers if required. Um, the concern the ICCL has is that while the ECHR has not yet made a finding that Ireland is in violation of Article 3 in relation to our stance on lethal fatal abnormality. It is certainly arguable, and we would say strongly arguable, that we are in breach. And rather than waiting to be brought to the ECHR and be told that we are in violation of these women's rights, we would strongly urge this committee to recommend making provision for allowing a termination in a case of a fetal fatal abnormality so that Ireland can actively improve our protection of human rights. This does give rise to a concern, and I know this is something that was addressed this morning, in relation to Article 40.33 and whether or not that would permit a termination in the case of a lethal fetal abnormality, because obviously it provides for the right to life of the unborn, which is to be vindicated insofar as is practicable. It is at least arguable that that would allow a termination in the case of a fatal fetal abnormality. Whether or not the right is engaged at all 
is an open question, and certainly whether or not vindicating it insofar as it's practicable requires a woman to go full term for a pregnancy that will not result in birth is also an open question. And I'm not the first person to be making this argument. This precise argument was made by the Irish government in the D in Ireland case before the European Court of Human Rights, which was an admissibility decision. Ms. D had gone to, to Europe without seeking redress in the Irish courts, and it was argued by the Irish state that she should have sought redress in the Irish courts and had therefore failed to exhaust her domestic remedies. The argument made by the Irish state was that had she gone to the High Court, it was at least tenable that she would have successfully obtained a mandatory injunction requiring her to be permitted to have an abortion. And so if that argument is being made by the Irish state and being accepted as a feasible argument by the European Court of Human Rights, I think it is at least arguable that if legislation is passed by this, these houses uh, providing for lethal fetal abnormality, then it is at least arguable that it is constitutional. We would say there is a strong argument that it is required under Article 3. In relation to any residual concerns around constitutionality, we would suggest that ultimately uh, it is open to the President in consultation with the Council of State to refer any bill coming from the Oireachtas to the Supreme Court under Article 26 of the Constitution. It seems certainly plausible that might happen. But even if it doesn't, I think it is our view and is the view of many lawyers that ultimately whatever legislation is passed here is going to find itself in the Supreme Court one way or the other. I hope that that is not in any way a disrespectful comment. I don't mean it in a disrespectful manner. I think the history of this issue is that litigation has certainly been the order of the day a great deal of the time. So I think that the House can embrace that. The House can say, look, our legislation is ultimately going to be approved by the Supreme Court or examined by the Supreme Court, and so there's no need necessarily to run away from that. So on those two core points, the ICCL takes the view that, first of all, as regards the X test and the need for legislation, that is a matter of settled law. As regards lethal fetal abnormality, there is a strong argument that Article 3 requires access to an abortion in those circumstances, although the issue has not been addressed yet by the European Court, and we would argue that Article 40.33 would permit it. In closing, I will make one brief comment in relation to the ICCL as an organisation. As I've indicated, we are an organisation engaged in monitoring education and campaigning. We are here today particularly because we have expertise in relation to human rights law, and we're hoping to make that available to the committee. We are also a campaigning organisation. And it is our stance in relation to, to abortion that we are of the view in cases of incest, cases of rape, and cases of a threat to health, as a campaigning organisation, we support access to abortion in those circumstances. That is not a matter for this committee today. Any of those three things would most probably require a constitutional amendment. But I mention it because I want to be transparent about our position in relation to this, and I don't want it to be said at any point that we were seeking to hide our position in relation to that. We have both expertise and a campaigning angle we're here today in relation to our expertise, but I want to be transparent in relation to the campaigning. I'm very grateful to the committee for attention. I'd be happy to answer questions that you may have. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Senator McSherry, on behalf of Fianna Fáil. Very briefly, to thanks for the presentation. And just on the issue of uh, Article 3 of the Convention, uh, can I ask you just to go into a little bit more detail once again for us that are non-legally minded, uh, how you would reconcile that uh, with the view um, the protection afforded the unborn child under the Article 43.3. Well, thank you, Chair. And at the outset, I want to welcome both Dr. Brady and Mr. O'Hare from the Irish Council for Civil Liberties and to commend them on the work not only in this particular instance but across a whole range of issues on which they campaign. I think it's important just noting from your um, contribution, both orally and indeed the written submission that you forwarded to the committee that what we're being asked to consider as legislators is the need for legislation to give, as you say, meaningful effect to the existing constitutional rights of pregnant women whose lives are at risk. And I think that that has to be emphasized uh, time after time. Ireland has a legal obligation uh, and in this instance, uh, as the expert report has indicated, you know, what we're being asked to do is to provide a, for the judgment of the A, B and C case, not only legally and procedurally in a sound way, but constitutionally sound also. And I think that uh, that, that is, is something that needs to be borne in mind. I've noted from your contribution that, uh, you know, you're looking at 
giving effect to this as an absolute bare minimum. You have outlined, uh, Dr. Brady, a number of additional points that you would like to see also addressed, and uh, not least of these are the issues arising around fatal, fetal abnormalities, and we've made reference to this in the earlier section. And um, I just uh, ask your further elaboration, I mean, where fetal life cannot be born alive and will not survive outside the womb, can it really be said that in these circumstances the right to life of the unborn is constitutionally equal to the right to life of the woman? Um, I, I think that there is, of course, the added position of the Irish government in the D versus Ireland case, where there is an acknowledgement that um, this particular matter could be legislated for, and that the existing constitutional position in Article 43.3 uh, would stand that there would not be a conflict in relation to uh, both of these positions. I'd just like your further elaboration on it. Uh, we earlier heard from Dr. Simon Mills, you know, who presented us with a copy of draft legislation, that it is within the compass of legislators to bring forward provision to accommodate this particular matter. And I'd just like your further confirmation of that from not only the ICCL's position, but your respective uh, legal uh, training and knowledge. Uh, Deputy Seamus Healy. Uh, uh, and just to welcome the uh, representatives from the Irish Council of Civil Liberties. Um, much of the territory here has been uh, dealt with earlier this morning and to some extent yesterday, I suppose. But I certainly welcome the, um, the clarity in relation to settled issues and then the, uh, the um, question of the opportunity for, for development. Um, could I just ask for clarification uh, in relation to uh, the, the current situation uh, and specifically in relation to the uh, 1992 and 2002 referendums? Uh, that has been, as you know, an issue and uh, there, there's been a divergence of opinion as to whether or not uh, the question of suicide was or was not uh, ruled out as a result of or ruled in as a result of those particular uh, referendums. Um, Again, just uh, in general, the Council's view in relation to the expert report and would be the Council's view that uh, the option of legislation and uh, regulation would be the, uh, the correct uh, way to go. Um, <coughs> the assessment uh, by doctors uh, in relation to the, the area, uh, has the Council a view on that as to, for instance, the, the the number of doctors necessary, uh, uh, whether, in, whether a single specialist uh, or more than one uh, specialist would be required. Um, the question of lethal uh, fetal abnormality was one I raised yesterday and again this morning. Uh, and uh, I just wonder if the um, council would just uh, expand and clarify their views uh, on, on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy. And finally, Deputy Dennis Nocton in this session. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, just uh, one question uh, for Dr. Brady, and thank him for, for his evidence. Um, if we come back to the, the European Court of Human Rights judgment, and the judgment um, uh, basically made the point that, look, there needs to be reasonable or practical access uh, to a termination in certain circumstances in Ireland, and there's a responsibility on the state here to put that process uh, in place, and that's why we're dealing with this uh, and debating this today. Now, it had been inferred earlier here <coughs> that sign-off by three doctors would run contrary to the European Court of Human Rights judgment. And we had evidence here from the professionals in the field, uh, from obstetricians who said uh, that uh, there would have to be, in their view, two obstetrician uh, specialists sign-off uh, plus a specialist in a particular field, including, uh, in the case of suicide, uh, a specialist in psychiatry. Um, so that would be a minimum, in some cases, of three uh, doctors having to sign off. Uh, and the perinatal psychiatrists uh, gave evidence here yesterday that in the case of suicide, that it was their opinion that two psychiatrists uh, should sign off. So in those cases, you're talking about probably a minimum 
of three and maybe up to four specialists having to sign off, uh, would that run contrary uh, to the European Court of Human Rights uh, judgment in light of the fact that these are the professionals at the coal face that are making <coughs> these points? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Brady. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, after you reply, so. um, Thank you very much. Um, to begin, in relation to Senator McSharry's concern, uh, the, the concern in relation to Article 3 is there's been, been two recent cases involving Poland, both involved women who under Polish law were entitled to an abortion. One was a 14-year-old who had been raped, the other was a woman facing a very severe fetal abnormality. Uh, I don't know that it was fatal, um, although Polish law provided for abortion in circumstances of severe fetal abnormality as opposed to merely the, the bare, bare fatality. In both instances there were very substantial delays, there was a lot of procrastination by doctors uh, in relation to the 14-year-old, her details were made public. And the, the ECHO was very critical of the way that it was handled uh, in relation to it. Uh, the upshot of it is that the European Court took the view that Article 3, the protection against inhuman and degrading treatment, was engaged. Uh, and therefore, if you look at the specific person you're facing, as opposed to some general generic person, if the specific vulnerable woman is in circumstances whereby her treatment reaches the threshold required for Article 3, then an Article free violation is possible. There are very few members of the Council of Europe who do not provide for abortion in cases of lethal fetal abnormality. So Ireland is one of the few that might likely be taken, but certainly we, we'd suggest that there's a strong argument that an Article 3 violation might be found. In relation then to uh, Article 40.33, and this to some extent moves on to the, the, the point that uh, uh, Deputy O'Quailon raised, uh, in the, the Roach case, which I, I suspect may have been mentioned this morning, I wasn't in a position to, to watch the testimony this morning, the Supreme Court found that the right to life of the unborn requires the capacity to be born. And in circumstances where there is clear medical evidence that the, the, the fetus will not be born, then based on that assessment of the Supreme Court, I think it is certainly strongly arguable that 43.3 does not actually arise. Even if it were to arise, the obligation on the state in relation to 43.3 is to vindicate insofar as is practicable. And so a uh, court might take the view, yes, it arises, but in certain where the, the fetus can't survive outside the womb, to some extent, what, what can the state be expected to do to vindicate that right to life, given that to some extent it is uh, a cipher? Uh, I hope that addresses that, that point. In relation to, to, to Deputy O'Quillon, um, absolutely we would endorse the, the, the view he's expressed in relation to the need for clarity. Um, and in relation to um, the D in Ireland decision and the ECHR's position in relation to that, Recognition was given there of the fact that sometimes novel interpretations of constitutional rights are required. This is not something that is somehow aberrant. This is inherent to constitutional rights. They are, by definition, broad norms of very general application, and we entrust our courts to work out the precise detail in relation to that. Uh, the ECHR recognised that the suicide uh, criterion in the X case was something that could not necessarily have been anticipated in advance. And certainly were the High Court or the Supreme Court on appeal to address the question of fatal fetal abnormality, I think there was a very strong chance that they would take the view that it is permissible under Article 40.33. Again, I can't tell you that with any great degree of certainty because ultimately it's something that will have to be determined. Uh, certainly as a practicing lawyer, when one is asked questions in relation to things like this, often the advice one is giving is the best guess one that could come up with and ultimately is determined by a court. However, I think a distinction can be drawn between the D in Ireland case where what was being said to the woman was, well, you should have gone to the High Court in circumstances where there is no legislation and ask the High Court to give you an injunction. We can distinguish between that circumstance and a circumstance where the Oireachtas has passed legislation allowing for termination in those circumstances. I think that the, the, the history of the relationship between the courts and the Oireachtas is that there is strong deference paid to decisions taken by the democratically elected legislature of this state. And if the state had passed legislation in that regard, I think it is certainly arguable that some degree of deference might be paid to it by the courts if the question comes before them. Um, in relation to... Um, the question raised by uh, uh, Deputy Healy in relation to the amendments. The Irish Constitution has been amended 31 times since uh, it was introduced in 1937. On five occasions, the same question has been put to the people twice, or roughly the same question. Those five occasions are introducing first past the post, uh, divorce, Lisbon, Nice, and removing the suicide criterion from X. Of those five, in three of them, the answer changed as between the two referenda. In the other two, first past the post and removing the suicide criterion, the answer was the same both times. 
It, 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 I think the idea that we need a, a further referendum on this is to some extent, with the greatest respect to those who are making the argument, something of a red herring. I think in relation to things like Lisbon and Nice, where people are being faced with a, a very, very detailed slate of issues. I mean, the Lisbon and Nice treaties are very lengthy. They involve lots of different divergent matters. The idea that parsing the reasons why people voted a certain way perhaps has some merit in that circumstance. But I don't see that it has merit in circumstances where a fairly simple and straightforward question is put. Both the 92 proposal and the 2002 proposal involved removing this criterion of suicide, and both of them failed. We, we can say there's you know, different, side, you know, different pressure groups and different um, campaigning organisations took different views, and if they'd said different things, different things would have happened. I think that that is to do a disservice to the electorate. The Irish people understood the questions they were being asked and gave the same answer both times. I think to some extent, bringing that out again is a little bit of a red herring. And then uh, finally, in relation to uh, Deputy, Deputy Nocton's question in relation to the, uh, the, the ECHR decisions, there is a positive obligation under Article 8, and that is what has been found to be breached in the ABC case. But I would also mention to the court, and it, the citation is in my submission, the case of Tussoc and Poland, which is a decision from 2007, in which the European Court looked at situations where there was a disagreement between a woman and her doctors on whether or not she qualified. And they said that there were a number of things that would have to be provided for. There has to be an objective mechanism for resolving that disagreement, that uh, the woman has got to be heard possibly through an oral hearing, but certainly has to be heard, and that it must be dealt with in a timely fashion. Now, I, I don't wish to second-guess medical evidence that was given yesterday. The expert report has recommended two, two doctors at specialist level, and certainly that is what the Irish Council for Civil Liberties would recommend. Uh, it may be an obstetrician and a, and a psychiatrist, maybe two obstetricians and so on. If the doctors themselves felt that they needed additional opinion, and again, I know there was lengthy evidence on this yesterday, we wouldn't be seeking to second-guess that. However, the criterion made very clear in the Tissot decision is that it must be timely. And I think that is a particular concern. Where we are in a situation where somebody is seeking to have an abortion and there is a threat to their life, the clock is ticking. And whatever mechanism is put together by these houses, it has to be capable of quick resolution. The concern is that if there is four, five, six different doctors have to give opinions, particularly if you are away from uh, one of the, 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 the main maternity hospitals in Dublin, for example, it may take some time. And that will be the particular concern the ICCL would have in relation to that system. And particularly the Tissot decision is quite clear on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Burke. <clears throat> thank you, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation this morning. It's just come back to the fatal, um, fatal abnormality issue. Um, if there was provision made for that in the legislation, are you satisfied, and because I just want to clarify this, that, that Ireland then would be within Article 3 of the Convention, if, if it's just specifically, uh, and the definition given this morning was that where there is no prospect of the fetus once born will, will survive even for one second, and that's the definition that was given here this morning. The second issue is in relation to the floodgates. We heard yesterday from Professor Patricia Casey saying that if legislation um, is enacted, and it's enacted within the uh, confines of Article 40, uh, Section 3, Subsection 3, that she was saying that will open the floodgates. What is your view if legislation is uh, put in place, and it has to be within Article 40, Section 3, Subsection 3, are you, what's your view as regards it opening the floodgates? And the third issue you raise there, it's in relation to getting the President to refer it uh, to the Supreme Court uh, under Article 26 of the Constitution. Um, as you know, the Government has no influence on that. The Council of State may advise the the president, but the final decision is the president's. Um, do you be, uh, do you do you believe that that is an option that I suppose the president should look at uh, as one of bringing a conclusion to this matter? Thank you, uh, Deputy Rebel Dodds. Uh, um, if we were to legislate in relation to allowing abortion in cases of rape. What would require to be done? Thank you. Uh, Senator John Crone. A uh, brief one, thank you. I, I, I please understand that I, I come from this with no particular ideological baggage. My own position is that an early embryo does not have the rights of a person 
and that many fetuses that are legally aborted in otherwise civilized countries in the UK are in fact humans who are being deprived of their right uh, to personhood, uh, a process which I believe occurs someplace during gestation as yet undefined due to the failings of my profession to ethically grasp the nettle which they should have grasped. At what stage does the Council of Civil Liberties believe that a fetus acquires some rights which would be defended by the actions of the Council? Thank you. Uh, Dep uh, Deputy Thank you very much. Uh, th thanks, um, uh, Dr. Brady, and I think it's Mr. O'Hara. I can't see your name, but I think that's what it is. It's it's right. Right. Yeah. yeah, just um, I suppose we've listened yesterday and uh, today, this morning to the legal end, and yesterday to the doctors. And I suppose what struck me yesterday was um, the hearing uh, from the, um, the master of the Rotunda Hospital and the master of Hollow Street. And both of them said very clearly, uh, said it quite loudly as well, that they should be allowed to do their job. And it's just in, in this um, piece here, around 58 and 59 of the offences against the state. I just want to ask you just a little short question on it. Um, if, if this was replaced or repealed, uh, how do you think that this would um, influence doctors' decision? Would it be a good idea? Would it make it easier, and I don't mean to allow them to play God, but it would make their role easier, and would we not be debating some of the issues here, like suicide, like uh, fetal uh, admiralties? I'd just like to know what your broader feeling on that is, if that was replaced. Thanks. Thank you. Senator Van Turnout. Okay. My question has been asked. Thank you. Deputy Mary Mitchell O'Connor. Uh, thank you. I want to ask you about, um, on page two of your submission there, point eight, you say uh, pregnancies involving a defined set of fatal, fe fatal fetal abnormalities. And I would, I'd like you to clarify what you mean by a defined set of fatal, fetal abnormalities. Thank you. And finally, Deputy Nocton, very briefly, you already... Yeah, just uh, on the, the fatal fetal abnormalities, uh, you've made the case in your presentation that protection under 43.3 of the Constitution uh, you believe doesn't, based on, on the Roach uh, case, doesn't uh, extend to uh, fatal fetal abnormalities. Now, there is a difference between no prospect of being born, which would be a non-implanted embryo, uh, and no prospect of life outside the womb. Uh, for example, a stillbirth would fall under one category and not under the other. So, can I just clarify that? Because the... Uh, legal judgment that has been made in relation to this is in relation to an embryo uh, and it wouldn't, a non-implanted embryo would not uh, have life outside the womb because there is no opportunity of, of being born. Is there a difference there and if you could clarify that? I'm sorry Deputy Conway, Vice Chairman. Um, thank you and sorry I wasn't present in the chamber for your um, presentation but I was listening and I have read it but there's something that you haven't dealt with and I was just wondering maybe if I could get your position on and it's something that I have asked others uh, that have appeared is in relation to consent. Um, again reverting back to the, the X case and that the, the, the age of the girl was 14. Um, we heard um, this morning already from some of the legal e experts um, in relation to the Law Reform Commission and uh, their document in relation to uh, medical consent but that again ex as I understand it deals with 15, 16 and 17 year olds and yet the girl in X was 14 years of age. So I, I, I would like to, 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 to get your position in relation to consent. Thank, Thank you. Dr Brady. Uh, thank you very much. Two minutes in this session left. Just, just to get back in the very well, I'll, I'll do my best to be brief. I'm trying to find where I was in my notes. My apologies. My apologies. Um, in relation to uh, the fatal fetal abnormality and uh, us being within Article 3 if we provided for it, I I'm not sure that necessarily that is the case, but again, this is a difficult question to answer because the European Convention on Human Rights is treated as a living document. It is interpreted on an ongoing basis by the European Court of Human Rights. Certainly their analysis to date would suggest uh, that denying abortion in cases of lethal fetal abnormality may be a violation. I think an argument could also be made now that Article 3 has been found to be part of the analysis in relation to abortion that cases of rape or incest might also require it under Article 3. However, I think, and this comes on uh, to the question, asked by Deputy Dowds, that I don't think it would be permissible under Article 43.3 at the moment to provide for abortion in cases of rape or incest. I think that would require a constitutional amendment. Um, in relation to, uh, I mean, uh, I think phrases like floodgates are, are possibly unhelpful in these circumstances, 
uh, and I know that this is something that was discussed in some detail yesterday, the Irish Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, says that where a doctor is satisfied that there's a real substantial risk to life and termination is required to avoid that risk, the woman is entitled to it. Now, that's the test, and we're going to have to trust our doctors to apply that test in practice. And certainly, I understand that yesterday some umbrage was taken by the suggestion that doctors wouldn't be capable of applying that test. So I think that the floodgates argument, again, is something of, an, of, a, of a red herring. Um, in relation to Senator Crown's point, um, I, I'm not going to take a position on a specific date. I'm not going to tell you it's at three weeks or whatever. Um, certainly, as an organisation basing its analysis on, on constitutional rights and legal expertise, the position taken in the Roach case was that at the point of implantation, the rights under 43.3 enter into effect. And so that is the point, as far as the Irish Constitution is concerned, at which that right to life of the unborn arises. However, it is important to distinguish between the right to life of the unborn under Article 43.3 and the constitutional rights of a born person under the rest of the Constitution. The Constitution does draw that distinction. So it is a specialised right specific to an unborn child. And so I, I, I realise that that may not specifically answer your question, but that is as far as I'm going to go because I want to keep us to the constitutional rights provisions themselves. Um, my apologies. In relation, in relation to, to, to Deputy Byrne's point on the, the Article f Section 58 and 59, uh, doctors in this situation are already making a decision about life and death. They're already uh, faced with very, very tough, difficult choices. What Sections 58 and 59 do is put in an additional, very unpleasant factor the possibility of going to jail for life. Now, penal servitude has been mentioned previously, that was abolished in 1997, and now it's, it will be life imprisonment. But that is, in a situation where a doctor is making this kind of life or death decision, I don't think it is helpful for a doctor to have that weighing in the balance. Absolutely, the Irish Council of Facilities is of the view that it should be repealed, but repealing it on its own is not sufficient, because under Article 8, we still require an accessible mechanism for the constitutional right to be activated. Removing that would not of itself suffice, because in circumstances where, for example, there was a difference of opinion in relation to whether or not there was a threat to life, a difference of opinion between, say, the woman and her doctors, or as between doctors. Some mechanism for resolving that and resolving it quickly is required. As regards criminalising um, abortion outside the setting of uh, a medical treatment, certainly I don't think there's any difficulty with the replacement of, our, of Section 58 and 59 with regard to what we commonly call backstreet abortion, where an abortion is not being performed by an obstetrician in a hospital. I think the state has a legitimate interest in, in order to protect the right to life of the woman to ensure that that doesn't take place. Um, in relation then, my apologies, my, sorry, the defined set of fatal fetal abnormalities uh, as raised by, by Deputy Mitchell O'Connor. Um, again, the particular things we were, we were considering when we were discussing was things like Edwards syndrome and Kefli where the, the brain doesn't develop. But again, we, we would certainly be uh, open to uh, views of medical practitioners particularly. I mean, the core point we would make is where a doctor has said this fetus will not survive outside the womb. That is the circumstance in which we think it is clear that there will be no difficulty as regards Article 43.3 in providing for a termination in those circumstances. I, I, I'm not a medical person. I'm not going to give you a specific list, but I hope that gives you some indication and goes some way towards answering your question. And again, I think the important thing here is we need to trust our medical professions in relation to that. Uh, Deputy Nocton asked a, a quick follow-up question in relation to implantation. The Roach case says that the Article 43.3 right doesn't arise until, until implantation. So it arrives at that point. As regards the possibility of being born, for that right to be engaged, there must also be the possibility of being born. Again, the Roach case is not an abortion case, it's a, it's a frozen embryo case, but it is to some extent all we have at the moment in terms of guidance from the Supreme Court on precisely what uh, the meaning of the right to life in relation to that is. Sorry, the, yeah, I, I, I think, yes, I think that's probably a, a, a fair assessment, but I think there would possibly be some leeway. And, and also bear in mind, the obligation on the state is to vindicate insofar as it's practicable. So there may be some leeway there for, for, for these houses to take a decision on precisely how it wants to define it. Uh, then finally, in relation to, to, to Deputy Conway, um, Section 23 of the Non-Fatal Offences Against the Person Act uh, provides that over 16 you can consent to medical treatment regardless of the position of the parents. I think the Law Reform Commission uh, recommendation which has been commended does take account of the fact that in most instances 
uh, the, 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 the consent or otherwise treatment will be done through the parents. It will be only in very rare and exceptional circumstances that there might be another view taken, uh, that the best interest of the child should govern. Now, the X case is not a very good example on that point because the parents in that situation were in favour of the child having abortion. A better example for that purpose is the C case, in which the child was actually in care and a decision was being made by the HSE and the parents were objecting to it. Now, substantial psychiatric evidence was heard in the district court in that case. The High Court said, having looked at the transcript of evidence, that it failed to see how any court could have taken any other view in relation to the, the need to allow that child to have a termination. So uh, again, there will be circumstances, possibly through care proceeding, uh, the, the precise legislation on foot of a Lower Foreign Commission report is something I don't want to second guess at this early juncture, but certainly provision can be made. I think our position would be best interest of the child should be the paramount consideration, and certainly that has recently become the paramount consideration in certain types of litigation under the Constitution uh, in light of the recent Constitutional Amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, we have eight minutes in this session remaining. Any members offering? Senator Brock? The, the referral to the Supreme Court by the President didn't address that. I, I certainly don't want to second get the President. The President has discretion in relation to that. I, I mention it because I think it is something that may happen. But I also say that even if it doesn't happen, uh, it is certainly my considered view that this is, a, this is a piece of legislation that will find itself in the Supreme Court one way or the other. And I don't think that these houses need to be afraid of that. I think that there is a dialogue that can take place between the legislature and the Supreme Court in terms of the precise definition of our constitutional rights. And I think that that is a process that the, house, the houses should engage in. My apologies for not answering your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, we move to the uh, 15 minutes for the non-members of the committee. And there are a number of indicators already, so I start with... The following Senators Batchik, Bradford and Walsh in that order. Senator Batchik, you have two minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for the very clear presentation uh, to Dr. Brady. Uh, I think we've heard yesterday from the medical experts and indeed this morning from legal experts a consensus emerge on the need for legislation and regulations in accordance in, indeed with the government decision taken before Christmas. Um, I want to just raise a couple of points about that. First, that the legislation must provide for an accessible and effective procedure. And again, coming back to something Senator Burke and others have been raising about the number of doctors required. Uh, the expert group report in Chapter 6, which sets out a clear blueprint for the sort of issues to be dealt with in legislation, seems to suggest two doctors should be sufficient, uh, one of whom, in the case of suicide risk, might be required to be a psychiatrist. Is it your view that any more than two, requiring, for example, three or four as a matter of routine, would render the procedure inaccessible or ineffective for women, particularly outside of Dublin? And indeed, should, and can you cure that in some way through provision for emergencies where you might just, uh, where a doctor could be permitted to proceed without, uh, without uh, just one opinion? And secondly, just on the fatal fetal abnormality question, and again, uh, very helpfully, you've taken, I think, the, 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 this issue slightly further than we heard earlier. We heard earlier in respect of the DV uh, Ireland case in 2005, where the Irish government itself argued that it was, at the very least, uh, a tenable argument that in cases of fatal fetal abnormality, a woman would have a right to abortion in Ireland because there would be no uh, right to life of the unborn capable of being protected. Uh, it was taken further in the later case of Roach, and you've then referred us very helpfully to the two Polish cases of 2011 and 2011. 2012 before the European Court of Human Rights, which, make, which uh, you know, appear to suggest that litigation in Ireland would be very likely to su succeed for a woman who'd been denied an abortion here in the case of a fatal fetal abnormality was forced to travel abroad, as we know uh, happens uh, regularly, and, uh, uh, and where the Irish government has itself envisaged that, where we now have the Polish decisions, is it your view that such litigation would succeed where the woman would be successful in establishing a breach of Thank Article you. 3, and is it in the interest of preventing that litigation that we should therefore be legislating now to to provide for a right to abortion in such a very limited